I was excited when Ben told me this is what I was doing because it meant my streak was alive. <laughs> and let me, let me tell you what I mean by that. Uh, this is my sixth lesson that I've done for Chi Beta where I was assigned the topic. This is my sixth lesson that I will have done on suffering or some form of it. When our theme was God is, I got God is good even when life isn't. Uh, when our theme was rooted, I got the story of the blind man who was healed but not healed entirely. And it was supposed to be about how like God does things but sometimes life is still bad. And so this has just been a nice little theme all throughout my collegiate career. Uh, I don't know what the equivalent of typecast is for speaking, but I've found it. <laughs> I'm really excited. Uh, I do feel like I should come out and say I don't know if boldness and suffering is, is necessarily what I would use to describe my life, but I'm excited to study it with you. Uh, if you have your Bibles and you're going to be reading along, I'd encourage you to go ahead and just open up to Job chapter 1. Uh, obviously, Job is, is 42, book, 42 chapters, so we're not going to necessarily go through in a, what you might call, verse for verse <coughs> manner for this. Uh, what I really want to study with you tonight, what I really want to learn is, what does it mean to have boldness and suffering? Because I think a lot of us struggle with that idea, and I think the reason we struggle is because we have a, a misconception exactly about what boldness and suffering looks like. A lot of us are familiar with the story of Job, but I want to just go over a couple of basics. The, it starts, we're going to start reading in Job chapter 1, verse 6. One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing, Satan replied? Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds and are, are spread throughout the land. But now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And this has always been, to me, one of the most interesting passages in all of Scripture for a couple reasons. But maybe the most is because of what God says about Job. I could make a list of, of guys that I think are just awesome. I could make you a list of, of people who I would say are spiritual giants in my life. I could come up with 20 names in five seconds just because of all the wonderful people who have been brought into my life because of things like this in church. But I don't know their inner thoughts. You know, I don't know all of their struggles. I don't know what they go through when they're alone. God knows everything. I, I, the way that I had it explained to me once, the way that stuck with me, uh, if you've ever been in a class with me, uh, you've probably noticed that I have the ability to do all kinds of things in class, but actually pay attention to class. Uh, I wrote this lesson in a class. Uh, I do homework for other classes in class. <laughs> One of my favorite things to do in class, though, is, is Twitter. I, I just love to look at Twitter, and the reason is because I strictly follow like 10 people who I think are funny and like 50 sports accounts, and they're all about the NFL draft because it's all these people who are actually there and actually know things about these players, and they're saying, yeah, no, he's not as good as you think he is, or no, this guy's actually a lot better than you think he is, and the reason that matters to me is because they have all this inside information that I'm not privy to. <coughs> There's something similar going on here. When God says Job is the best of the best, Job fears God, Job respects God, Job loves me and he'll stay close to me, that is God himself speaking. Job's character really is that good. There's no bias there. There's no human opinion. Job is just that good. And I think that's important to understanding what comes next in the book. And we all know how this plays out. God allows Satan to take everything from Job. He allows him to, just to take his family, to take his property, all in the span of a day. 
And how does Job respond? It's probably the most popular verse in the entire book. It says in verse 20, At this Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. Then he fell on the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised, or blessed be the name of the Lord. And when we think of Job, when we think of boldness in Job, that's probably the first thing that comes to mind, is that statement, that definitive statement that, Blessed be the name of the Lord. His family has been killed. His house has been destroyed. He's lost all of his livelihood. And he stands there and he looks people in the face and he says, yeah, but but God's still good. The only problem with that image of Job, the only issue I think that that gives us is that's only the first chapter. And there's still so much more to go. Job chapter 3 gives us a very different image of Job. You see, what's happened since then is Satan has gone back to God, and he said, yeah, this is impressive, but the only reason it's worked is because you wouldn't let me actually hurt him. I was allowed to hurt everything around him, but I couldn't hurt him. And so God says, that's a fair point. Go back. Anything short of killing him, anything short of killing him, you can do. And so the Bible tells us that Job is covered head to toe in these boils. And I have looked endlessly to try and find some sort of of medical (coughs) comparison of of what this was, but there's really no explanation for it. What what I've always pictured, what I picture now when I think about it, uh, this summer, my first first day on the job where I interned at, uh, interned at Madison Church of Christ, I went to the hospital to visit a guy who'd just been taken off of life support. Uh, His name was Ken Abernathy. He was a Vietnam vet. And when I walked in, uh, like I said, he'd been taken off life support. His skin had started to do this thing called weeping. Basically, all of his internal organs had shut down, and his skin was literally breaking open, and liquid from his body was just pouring out of it. When the Bible talks about Job, it talks about how his skin is bursting open. There's all this stuff coming out of it. And then on top of that, it says there are worms making their home inside of Job. So Job's suffering has been taken to a a different level. There's still all the pain that he had before of his family was taken, his house was taken, his livelihood was taken. But now he's physically suffering. And so Job has these these three friends who show up with the intent of comforting uh, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. And they show up with the intention of comforting them. And when they get there, they don't recognize Job. He is so disfigured from everything that's happened to him, they don't know that it's him for a little bit. And then when they sit down, they can't talk to him. The Bible says they sit there for a week in silence just all weeping together. And then Job finally opens his mouth. And what do you think he's going to say? After all, this is the last time we heard him, him really speak other than to, to mourn his, the loss of his family. He said, blessed be the name of the Lord. So what follows that up? Job chapter three, verse one. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. He said, may the day of my birth perish in the night that said a boy is conceived that day. May it turn to darkness. May God above not care about it. May no light shine on it. May gloom and utter darkness claim it once more. May a cloud settle over it. May blackness overwhelm it. That na- night may thick darkness seize it. May it not be included among the days of the year, nor be entered in any of the months. May that night be barren. May no shout of joy be heard of it. May those who curse days curse that day and we're not going to take time to read all of it but this kind of talk continues pretty much throughout the next uh, 30 chapters or so up to chapter 31 Job is constantly going back between blessed be the name of the Lord and also curse the day that I was born I hope I die and I think that leads us to 
the question of denial. What does it mean to be bold in suffering? Which Job was bold in his suffering? Because the same Job that said, blessed be the name of the Lord, is the one that said, please, someone, eliminate my existence, erase it from history, erase the day that I was born from history. Never let that happen. Curse it. It's the same Job who at the end of the book in 42 verse 1 is going to say, I know you, speaking to God, can do all things and no purpose of yours can be defeated. And he goes on to say that there is no higher purpose. These are all three, all those statements come from the same man. All of those statements come from someone who God said, there's no one better than Job. If you want to talk about the best of the best, Job's your guy. So which one of them, which attitude is right? I think we think of Job's suffering in a vacuum sometimes. We limit it to that one idea of Job stood up and said, blessed be the name of the Lord, and we're content to stop there. We say, that was Job. He was bold in his suffering. One of the, one of my least favorite days, no, it was probably my least favorite day of the semester, uh, was the first day of Mission Emphasis Day this past year, um, this, this past couple months. Uh, I was sitting in one of the sessions, I don't even remember which one, and my phone vibrated. And I was like, oh, well, I should probably see what this is. Uh, and so I opened it up, and uh, my dad had messaged me, which is not like a common thing. We don't talk. Uh, I'm kind of terrified of him, and I pretend that I'm not by making <coughs> jokes about it. Uh, and he's not exactly a nice guy, and he proceeds to tell me that uh, he has, the woman he's been with for three years now is trying to have him arrested for domestic abuse, and he's using again, and oh, he's also in the state of Tennessee. Uh, he thinks the campus that I posted pictures of is really pretty, and he'd like to see it. Um, and I <coughs> proceeded to just kind of freak out. I shut down that day. Uh, Mike can attest to this. I just would disappear. I would get in my car and I would just leave. I would try and and run away because I was terrified that he was going to show up here. I've done a fairly good job of keeping my life, my past life and my life at Freed separate. I don't bring people from here home and I don't bring home here. And in my mind, there was just this horrible collision course that was about to take place because it was all going to collide. He was going to show up here and I was, I'm still terrified of him. And then on top of that, everyone was going to see it. And it was just going to be this horrible disaster. And I remember sitting in my room that night and feeling like such a bad Christian because <clears throat> Blessed be the name of the Lord, right? I should be able to be fine with this, right? And I know I'm not the only one who has that attitude. We almost at times feel guilty for suffering. And that's why I think it's important to define what does it mean to be bold in suffering. Job said, blessed be the name of the Lord. That definitely happened. He definitely stood up and he affirmed that right away. Job also still suffered. It was not an either or situation. Job loved God. Job hated the situation that he was in. And they were not 
<coughs> mutually exclusive things. One of the most interesting things to me is is Job seven. Uh, the first the first three verses it says. Like a, sla like a slave longing for the evening shadows, or a hired laborer waiting to be paid, so I have been allotted months of futility, and nights of misery have been assigned to me. I don't know how many times I read over that verse without really thinking of the implications. That is only chapter 7 of a 42 chapter book that... It says throughout the later halves, about 15 to 30, says over and over again they would talk for days or they would talk for weeks. In the first seven chapters, Job says, I've been suffering for months. This has not been going on. I, I, when I would imagine Job, I would sometimes think of it as, as maybe a week. A few days of Job being horribly inconvenienced, and then at the end, God comes in and fixes it. But that's not how it happened. Job went through all of this. He endured the pain of losing everything and then also his physical suffering while everyone around him came and said, hey, you know this is happening to you because you're a filthy sinner, right? And he endured all of that for months. And he had his moments where he said, blessed be the name of the Lord. But he also had those moments where he did not know how to move on. Boldness in suffering does not mean that everything's okay. Boldness in suffering doesn't mean you have to be fine. Boldness in suffering is not suppressing how you're feeling and trying to put on this face that you've got it all together. First Peter 4.19 is interesting because it comes in this long passage that actually references the story of Job. Uh, and a few verses later in Job chapter or in First Peter 5 is when he's going to talk about your adversary, the devil, who walks about like a roaring lion. And first and, and Peter is given this whole plea with the audience of, of his letter, that they would continue on, that they would push on despite what was happening to them. And he says in 1 Peter 4.19, So then, those who suffer, suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. I read an article uh, for, actually for personal counseling, uh, about suffering and it was how humans physically react to or how humans mentally react to suffering was what it was about and they compared it to an adrenaline rush when you have an adrenaline rush you, there's this moment where you can feel like you can do anything and you're ready to take on the world but after that there comes a crash and eventually you, you bounce back from that too. And what they said was, suffering is not a, a constant state of being sad or a constant state of being happy. It's ebbs and flows of that. Where some days you're fine and some days you don't know how to move forward. Job was not bold because at the very beginning of his suffering, he stood up and said, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job was bold because every step of the way, even when he had those bad days, even when he said, cursed be the day I was born, even when he cries out in Job 16 and says, God, I don't understand why this is happening to me. He still always comes <coughs> back. Like in Job 22, when he says that there is no man like God with the power to tame the Leviathan. And that is the Lord, my God. It's not about being okay. Boldness in suffering is about trusting in God even when things aren't okay.